Sheila Jasnoff has contributed to building science and technology studies as a field. Her research focuses on science and the state in contemporary democratic societies. Her work has been quite relevant in the area of biotechnology policy, in science advice, and in the construction of, and I quote, this branch of knowledge creation called regulatory science, where the rules of legitimacy are different from the ones of basic research. So I think that's a good summary of my academic work, but what it leaves out is my role in creating the community of scholars that do science and technology studies. Mobile media culture has affected how science works in a lot of different ways. And when I'm talking about science, I don't mean just the natural sciences as they're conducted in laboratories, but the construction of knowledge far more broadly around the world. One shouldn't get caught up entirely in the enthusiasms of the instantaneous multiple um, universal communication feature of mobility because um, one tends to overlook that there are still frictions on the absorption side. So just because I'm able to send out a message does not mean that somebody is actually reflecting on it and absorbing it. So I think that although things have changed radically, we have to always keep our minds also on the part that doesn't change. And so the French uh, saying, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, I think that's a cautionary thing to remind oneself in the enthusiasm for the new that accompanies new technologies. So uh, there are, uh, the law is involved in the governance of new technologies from beginning to end. Uh, one of the misconceptions about the law is that the law is always lagging behind the scientific and technological developments, and this is a mistake because, in fact, the scientific and technological developments are taking place in a world that is already uh, overwritten or inscribed with law in many ways. But once we understand that, we also have to understand that legal concepts need to be further developed. The concept of privacy in Anglo-American law has been very individualistically centered, but the information technologies are creating the possibilities for new social formations. And the idea of protected knowledge or knowledge that should not be acquired or knowledge that should not be disseminated, uh, this is something that the concept of privacy cannot deal with adequately. When um, technologies change, um, the human subject also changes. One way in which the human subject today is different is that in addition to the physical person we are, we are also informational subjects. Uh, the law has to take account of this fact and regulate the informational subject as a new kind of being in the world. And that means that things that we don't worry physically um, information, how information gets mixed and combined and stored and perpetuated. These were worries we didn't have with the physical body. Uh, the physical body came into the world, eventually was buried or cremated or whatever, and that was the end of it. Uh, that is not true of the informational body. So law needs to take the appearance of a new political subject, the data subject, very seriously and think about what protections are due to it. Mobile and net, especially the internet, tie up with interdisciplinarity today because um, the mobile culture does not respect boundaries that social groups necessarily respect. So if you go into a university, you will find buildings with disciplines sitting inside them and people will go in at nine o'clock and they will leave at five o'clock and they will only see the people inside their building. Uh, the internet is a porous building. You can move from room to room without respecting the wall, in a sense. Um, and I think that historically, looking back to this era from 50 or 100 years on, one will find that the diffusion patterns of knowledge changed because the internet is a place of mobile walls, if you will, uh, and not of concrete and glass.
The question about the uh, mobile uh, communication culture and disciplinarity is uh, interesting against that background. I think the old way, the 20th century way of thinking about disciplines was that they covered all space. And if you had interdisciplinary territory, it would mean like going from one state to the next state, like the members of the European Union, for instance. There's no room between France and Belgium. France ends, Belgium begins, and that's it. But today, in thinking about the wider world that we have at our disposal through information technologies, I think we've begun to recognize that there are spaces, unexplored spaces, which are not actually covered by disciplines, and therefore a new sense of interdisciplinarity, which I accept has come into being, which is discovering and exploring new territories where the questions, the modes of doing research, the modes of relating to one another um, are not already laid down in classical disciplines. My field of science and technology studies is an example of a kind of interdisciplinarity that um, would have been harder to think of in the pre-internet era. Um, many people thought that uh, studying science and technology could be adequately done by putting side by side philosophy of technology, philosophy of science, history of technology, history of science, and so on and so on. But science and technology studies today is asking questions about the nature of objectivity, the nature of truth, which is in a different way from what philosophers asked, why different communities do science in different ways. There's a whole set of questions that I think have been enabled by um, people at the margins of older disciplines coming together and making a new territory that is a new field. Powerful technologies carry utopian visions with them. Uh, the internet technology, mobile technology in general, had a very strong utopian sensibility about open frontiers. Uh, it's important for us as we take stock of the technology to recognize the utopian side of it. In fact, it depends on money, it depends on access, it depends on something very straightforward like language. An English speaker has access to the internet in a way that, for instance, someone speaking my mother tongue, Bengali, does not have. So we should not ever forget that um, the technology of the rich is not the same as the technology of the poor, and the possibilities of access are still extremely unequal around the world. There was a dream around the internet. Um, we aren't there yet, we haven't achieved the dream, but we need the dream in order to make progress. Maybe collective and intelligence is one of those oxymorons because intelligence to some degree needs a reflective capability and that I think is still very individual and lodged in the person. Mobility and future hang together very nicely as part of a trope of progress. The thing that I would add to that trope to make it correspond better to reality is the word friction. So I would put mobility, friction, and future together to make a package. My quotation is Benedict Anderson's definition of nationality in his book, Imagined Communities. He says that a nation is an imagined political community and imagined as inherently limited but sovereign. I like the definition because it applies to many groupings in our internet world, not just nations, but also disciplines, also intellectual communities. One of my most popular phrases is technologies of humility. Uh, with that phrase, I signal that we should be paying attention to the things we don't know, to the things we've forgotten, to the things that we're uncertain about, not only focus on those things that we think we know. So the unknown has to come into view as much as the known.